Well, good morning, church family. Great to be here today in the house of the Lord. I'm curious, how many of you have ever had this experience? You're seeing a beautiful sunset at the beach, or, or maybe you're outside and there's this double rainbow that's gorgeous. Perhaps maybe a lightning storm with lightning flashes, and you think to yourself, this is stunning. This is so beautiful. I can't believe how amazing this is. I, I got to get a picture of this. And you pull out your cell phone and you take a picture and it's just not quite the same, right? <laughs> like you, you, you get that picture, you, you look at it and you're like, wow, that just doesn't even come close to describing the beauty that I just witnessed. I, I, uh, I had this exact experience just a couple months ago. My wife and I, uh, we were celebrating our 20-year wedding anniversary with this beautiful gal right here. Yeah, 20 years. <laughs> Love you. Um, and so uh, we were taking a trip. We, we uh, had a connecting flight in Seattle. We had to leave really early, like 5 a.m. And so we're flying up north to Seattle, 5 a.m., and, and as we're flying up north, I'm sitting on the right-hand side of the plane. The sun, literally the sun is rising above the horizon. I see this, this beautiful ball of yellow and orange rising above the horizon. And in front of me, I see Mount St. Helens. And then in the further distance, I see Mount Adams. And the sun as it's rising is casting the shadow in the valley. And the valley is filling with pinks and purples. And I'm like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And so I get my cell phone out and I get, turn on the clicker, sorry, hold on. I, I get my cell phone out and this is the picture I get. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just so disappointed. Like, it was, I promise you, it was so much better. <laughs> you, you had to have been there, you know? Oh my goodness, why is it, why is it that when we take a picture, it just doesn't quite come close to the real thing? Why is that? It's because, listen to this, the photo that we take is merely a picture of something that points to the real thing, which is better. You get what I'm saying? The photo that we have is merely a representation. It's merely an example, and it points to something that is better, because the real thing is always better. And this morning, as we continue our summer series called Defining Moments, every single Sunday, we are looking at a different Old Testament hero of the faith. We've looked at Abraham, we've looked at Solomon, Moses, and today we look at Joshua. And here's the thing, Joshua, by all accounts, was a great leader. I mean, he really was. He had big shoes to fill. He, he was the successor of Moses. And so I think, and, and there, there's an argument that can be made that Joshua was actually an even better leader than Moses was. But make no mistake, friends, Joshua was great, but all he did was point to someone greater. Joshua was great, but as we look this morning at the life of Joshua, we're going to see that there are some areas that he kind of missed. There were some areas where he wasn't quite the leader he should have been. And all the while, as we look at Joshua this morning, I want you to, as we study this Joshua chapter 9, I want you to have the frame and the lens of Jesus Christ in your mind. And remember that Joshua is merely the photo, the example that is pointing to someone better. He is pointing to someone greater. So as we study Joshua today, make no mistake, Joshua was great, but Jesus is better. And we're going to hopefully see how great Jesus actually is. And so turn in your Bible to Joshua chapter 9. That's where we're going to be in our text. The book of Joshua, it comes after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And while you're turning to Joshua chapter 9, let me give you a brief overview, kind of a, a biography of who Joshua was. We first meet Joshua in the book of Exodus. Uh, Moses had sent out 12 spies to kind of see the land of Canaan. This was the land that God promised the Israelites. He said, this is your promised land. And uh, Joshua was one of only two of the spies, him and Caleb. They come back and said, hey, 
we can do this. God's given us this land. The, the 10 other spies were like, no, there's giants in the land. We can't, we can't do it. We'll never live. Let's turn around and run away. And Joshua said, no, we got this. God is on our side. Uh, as Moses was nearing the end of his life in the book of Deuteronomy, God was the one that chose Joshua to be the successor of Moses, to lead the Israelites into the land of Canaan, the promised land. Again, big shoes to fill to be the successor of Moses, right? Um, so there he was, Joshua, in, in chapters 3 and 4. He miraculously led the Israelites across the Jordan River, which really marked and the beginning of the conquest of the land of Canaan. And, you know, Moses gets a lot of credit, you know, for, for the staff and the splitting of the sea and whatnot. But I'm telling you, Joshua 3 and 4, this was an incredible moment uh, for, for Joshua to, like, to, to have the, the uh, priest step into the river of Jordan and God stopped the flow of the river and the, all the Israelites went across on dry land. Uh, and then in chapter 6, Joshua led the battle of Jericho, where famous, famously they marched around it seven times and they blew the trumpet or the ram's horn. And if you look at today's trading card that Josh Espesandon illustrated for us, you're going to see Joshua holding that ram's horn. Uh, wonderful, amazing thing. Uh, he, Joshua led numerous victories over the Canaanites. He displayed remarkable leadership and faith in God. Joshua oversaw the division of the promised land. After they had conquered the land of Canaan, he divided it up into the 12 tribes to make sure each would receive an inheritance. And finally, Joshua served as the spiritual and military leader of Israel for many years. And then at the end of his life, he actually gathered the entire nation to renew their covenant with God. One commentator said it this way as I was studying. This commentator said, Joshua was a faithful and courageous leader who led the Israelites to conquer the promised land and secure their future as a nation. His legacy is one of faith, obedience, and devotion to God. Joshua was a great leader, but he was not perfect. Joshua was a great leader, but as we look at Joshua, really, he's pointing to someone who was better. He's pointing to Jesus who was perfect. And of course, we know Joshua wasn't perfect because he's a human, and we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We understand that. But it's interesting because when you think of defining moments in Joshua's life, there's many you could look at. You can look at the Battle of Jericho, which we talked about. We could look at the crossing of the Jordan River, which I mentioned. But I want to do something different this morning. I, I want to look at not a positive defining moment. I want to look at a negative defining moment. I want to look at an area where we actually see Joshua kind of messed up. He wasn't perfect. And I think the contrast of a good or even great leader it highlights more perfectly how amazing Jesus Christ was because Joshua was great, not perfect, but Jesus was perfect. And of course, this is the Sunday school answer. Uh, if you've been in Sunday school or if you've been walking with the Lord, you know Jesus is perfect. He never sinned. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. Jesus Christ was perfect in every way. Jesus was the kind of leader who had not just wisdom, but he had love. He had patience. Jesus always displayed every fruit of the Spirit. Jesus Christ, even on the cross, even when he was being crucified, being tormented, he never sinned. He never, uh, he never cursed his enemies. Jesus was perfect in every way. So as we look at Joshua, yeah, he was great, and he's definitely someone that's worth reading about, but remember, he's just a picture. He's just a photo. He's just an example of the real thing, because Jesus is better. What else about Joshua's life? Well, I think that what led to kind of the uh, unraveling, if you will, is that Joshua 
was very, very successful. And I believe the text doesn't specifically say this, but as you read some of Joshua, especially chapter 8, I believe that his success led to some pride or, or at least self-reliance. So if you think of it this way, uh, prior to Joshua chapter 9, he had had very successful things. He had successfully taken the entire nation across a giant river. That's pretty good. He had successfully uh, battled Jericho and captured the city. Literally, the walls came down. That's pretty good. Uh, in chapter 8, he conquered and even destroyed the city of Ai. I mean, Joshua was on a roll. Here he is, a very young leader, and he was just success after success. What happens when you get successful, right? When you become successful, how easy is it to take a look at yourself and say, wow, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good. I had three successful campaigns. And pretty soon you start relying on your own wisdom, right? Think of this way, if you're a student, okay? Uh, how, has it ever happened where you've had this big test and you're just a little unsure about your test. And so you cry out to God. You're like, Lord, help me. I, I need help. God, I don't know if I'm going to do good on this test. And you pray and you cry out to God because you're desperate, you know. And you cry out to God. And then you get an A and you're like, oh, I did pretty good. And maybe the next test you take, maybe you kind of throw a token prayer. Hey, God, you helped me last time. Help me again. And you get another A. Well, after three A's, four A's, five A's, pretty soon you say to yourself, man, I'm a really good student. Like I, like, I did really good. Like, and you're patting yourself on the back and you're saying to yourself, man, I, I got this whole school thing figured out. And before long, there's no need to ever pray to God again because you've got this on your own. And of course, we see this in other areas. Uh, in job, maybe your, your boss uh, gives you a, an assignment and you knock it out of the park and the boss starts just complimenting you, telling you what a great job you would do. And you're like, I did do a great job. I am pretty great at this. And so you become self-reliant. And, and everything that you, maybe at one point in desperation, you cried out, now on your own, you say, I got this. I'm pretty good at this. And what I want to remind you today, God asks us not to just cry out to him in the desperate times. God asks us to lean into him even in the successful times. And I think that's where Joshua missed it. In Joshua's success, instead of continuing to cry out and call out to God, Joshua became self-reliant and thought his wisdom was pretty good. Um, I, I said it this way. This is a, a Kevin quote right here. In our desperation, we often lean and look to God. In our success, we often lean and look to ourselves. Right? We've seen this before, yes? Like, when you are successful, you lean into you. When you have something desperate that you know you can't do on your own, you lean to God. And my friends, this morning, I want to encourage us to, in our desperation and in our success, to lean into God. And that's where Joshua missed the mark. He didn't lean into God. After three successful campaigns in the early parts of Joshua, he thought he was pretty hot stuff. But, again, Joshua points us to someone that is better. What did Jesus do in his success? In Jesus' success, he had humility. And so you start to see that contrast, that picture of Joshua. He's a, he's a nice sunset on a plane, but the real thing is better. Jesus is better. So think about the height of Jesus' ministry. Uh, Mark 10, for example. Uh, in, in that second half of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus could not go anywhere without a crowd of people surrounding him. He was famous. He, he was what would be a modern-day celebrity. He was famous, recognizable. Everyone wanted to see Jesus. Everyone wanted to touch Jesus, just, just to, to have him bless him. And here is Jesus at the height and success of his ministry. And look what he does in Mark chapter 10. 
So people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place hands on. But the disciples rebuked them. I mean, you can imagine almost the disciples were like, like his entourage, his bodyguard, you know, kind of make, make way for Jesus, big stuff coming through, Jesus coming through, right? And so uh, they, they're like, no, 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 G Jesus, he, he don't have time for those kids. He, he's, got, he's got teachings, he's got healings. No, you know, get the kids away. And Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then what did he do? <laughs> he stopped. He took the children in his arms. He placed his hands on them and blessed them. Jesus, in full humility, at the height of his success, at the top of his career, Jesus, in full humility, bent down, nailed down with the kids and said, no, let them come to me. And you can almost imagine Jesus just sitting there talking to these children, asking them what their favorite activity at home is, laughing with them, maybe telling them a joke. And Jesus, in full humility, in the height of his success, let the little children come to him. So we see more of that contrast between Joshua, who was great, and Jesus, who is better. But finally, what we see in our text as we look at chapter nine, we're gonna see that defining moment where things went wrong for Joshua. Because here in chapter nine, Joshua did not seek God's wisdom in a decision. Joshua had done such a great job at the battle of Jericho, pressing into the Lord. He has, he, he has sought God at the crossing of the Jordan River. And here in Joshua chapter nine, he made a fatal mistake, a defining moment, a negative defining moment in Joshua's career. He did not seek God's wisdom in a decision. So as we look at chapter nine, if you have your Bible, I actually want you to back up just, just a couple of verses, the last two verses of chapter eight. Chapter eight, verse 34. This is important, let me read this. So this is after conquering the city of Ai. After, afterward, verse 34 of chapter 8, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as, as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, uh, including to the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. That's important after, after capturing and destroying the city of Ai, Joshua and the whole nation gathered and they read the law. They read God's words to Moses. So I know, because the text tells me, I know that this verse was fresh on Joshua's mind. This is what God told Moses in Exodus 34. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you're going, or they will be a snare among you. So I know this was fresh on Joshua's mind. I know that he had full in his mind that God had given the land of Canaan to the Israelites, and that God was going to give them the whole land, all the land, and that they were not supposed to make treaties with anyone nearby. They weren't supposed to make covenants or any sort of pacts or deals. Don't make any treaties because the entire land is there. Now, if you want a little context of what this meant, here's a map of ancient Israel. So you see this green part right here, this whole area of Canaan, uh, this is what we now know as Israel. Back then it was called Canaan, and you can see this whole land is what God promised to Joshua and the Israelites. He said, this land is yours. Uh, and so let me zoom in a little bit. Right above, uh, right above the Dead Sea here, um, you can see what happened is they crossed the Jordan River, right? So they crossed the Jordan River, uh, and that was in Jer uh, Joshua 3. Then here's the Battle of Jericho, all right? The walls came tumbling down. And then Joshua 8, they went up to the city of Ai, and they conquered that city, all right? Now, you might notice there's a group of cities just south of Ai. 
all four of these cities make up what's known as the land of Gibeon. And we know that because verse 17 of chapter 9 tells us, look at verse 17 of chapter 9, the Israelites set out on the third day and came to the cities Gibeon, Kephira, Beeroth, and Kirith Jerim. So these four cities, Beeroth, Shephira, Kirith Jerim, and Gibeon, those four cities make up this whole area right here. Now, obviously, this was the land that God had promised the Israelites, this whole area. Here's the problem. These Gibeonites that were right in that area right there, they got really scared. They heard about Joshua and the Israelites. They heard about the conquering of Jericho. They heard about the conquering of Ai, and they thought to themselves, oh no, we're next. We gotta do something. And so what could only be classified as like a spy thriller movie, if you're into, you know, Tom Clancy or something, this, this is right up your alley. The Gibeonites, they devised this crazy plan that just might work, they thought to themselves. What they did, because they're only like, what, five miles away from Ai. They're definitely in the land of Canaan. They're definitely part of the land that God said, don't make a treaty with. They had a feeling that they were gonna get destroyed and so they made this crazy plan in Joshua 9. They, they found old moldy bread in the city. Uh, they found the most worn out clothes. They, they got water bags or wine skins and, and they made them just look all dirty and parched. And then they traveled and they showed up to Joshua and they showed up to Israel, the, the, the nation of Israel and they said, hey, oh my gosh, we've been traveling for months I mean, really, it's like a day's journey, okay? They're like, we've been traveling for months. You know, we came from way up north. And I mean, I mean look, 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 at, look at our, actually this here, this is the verse that Faith read. This is good. Faith Kemp read this. All right, verse 12. This is what the, this is the deception here, the giving eyes. They said in chapter nine, verse 12, this bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now, see how dry and moldy it is? And these wineskins that were filled new, look how cracked they are. Oh, and our clothes, our sandals, they're worn out by this very long journey. Verse 14, the Israelites sampled their provision. Here it is. This is the defining moment right here. But did not inquire of the Lord. The Israelites sampled their provision, but did not inquire of the Lord. Verse 15, then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Oh no, <laughs> like, do you realize what you've done? They didn't, they didn't get it. It wasn't until days later they were traveling and they came to the city of Gibeon. They're like, wait, you're the people Wait, you're, you're the people that were like two months, what, what are you doing here? And they find out they've been tricked. They had been tricked and they ratified it by oath. It was a covenant that they could never destroy these people. And that one moment became a defining moment in the nation of Israel because now the land of Canaan was never going to be fully Israelite people. The land of Canaan now had what God called foreigners in it. And that one decision had a trickle effect as you read the end of Joshua and as you get into the book of Judges and you start seeing the people in Judges that did what was ever right in their own eyes. And that came from a sinful, rebellious heart from a group of Gibeonites that were not supposed to be part of that land. That one defining moment in Joshua's career changed the entire trajectory and course of the nation of Israel all the way until 2 Samuel. Now, thankfully, God is sovereign. <laughs> and thankfully that in God's sovereignty, he was able to use this mistake of Joshua for his glory because that's what God does. He uses our failures and flaws. He uses our success and joys in every way. He displays his glory and his sovereignty. But this defining moment in Joshua's career changed the course of history forever. Because what happened? Joshua, he saw the, the moldy bread, he saw the worn out clothes, and he, in his self-reliance, maybe in his pride, in his success, he said, yeah, everything checks out. It passes the eye test, passes the sniff test, I think we're good. You know what? 
we could actually probably use uh, an ally up north. Wouldn't it be great to have allies way up north just in case anyone ever attacks us from up north? They, They could be our allies. It made sense. It was good military leadership. Joshua was a successful military leader, right? He got this. He helped the Israelites cross the Jordan River. He he helped defeat Jericho. Joshua was a fantastic military leader. And he looked at it, and in his own wisdom, he said, yeah, this is a good move, without consulting the Lord. And my friends, the application here today is do not make the same mistake as Joshua. Something that maybe seems like a good idea on paper, something that maybe even passes the eye test or the sniff test, don't jump into any sort of decision without first consulting the Lord. And I'm talking everything from big decisions like buying a house, uh, all the way, all the way to, uh, you know, Lord, uh, help me pick out a, a good animal for our home. You know, it's like those decisions should be bathed in prayer, leaning into God and not on our own wisdom. Because here's the reality. This is the truth, friends. There are so many things in our society right now that seem like a great idea. It makes sense. And the, and the prevailing wisdom of society around us, it, it tells us that these things are good. It's good to affirm things. Love is love. These are beautiful things. Isn't it wonderful? And we celebrate it. And we look at it. And if we're not careful, we see these things and we say, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. That actually is a beautiful thing. That is worth celebrating. We should affirm that. That's wonderful. Why aren't we affirming this more? And we start thinking in our own wisdom and in our own mindset, we start thinking, this is really good and this makes a lot of sense. This would be a wonderful thing for our country. And we do that without lining it up to the word of God. And we do it without consulting the Lord. And we do it without saying, God, what do you think about this? I have a whole society and culture around me telling me that this is the way I should think. But God, what do you think? Lord, give me wisdom to know if love is love. Give me wisdom to know what to affirm. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Are we going to God? Are we going to the word? Are we lining it up? Or are we relying on our own wisdom? And in this area, Joshua failed, but... There's something good. (laughs) Jesus, who is better. Joshua didn't seek God's wisdom, but Jesus, who is the better and more perfect picture of Joshua, what did he do? He always sought the wisdom of the Father God. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter seven, he said it this way, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. God, Jesus Christ, gave us the directions right there to come to Father God. And as if that wasn't enough, he actually earlier taught us how to pray. This is known as the Lord's Prayer. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Look at the appeal to the Father in this prayer. It is drenched and bathed in language towards the Father, seeking the Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look at this appeal right here. Give us, Father. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Time after time, Jesus modeled going to the Father, the thing that Joshua forgot Joshua forgot to go to the Father and seek the wisdom of the Father. He sought the wisdom of himself, his own self-reliance. Jesus, in his most critical moment, in his most desperate moment, when he was about to be crucified and he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating drops of blood, Jesus, what did he do? He cried out to the Father. He withdrew from the disciples at about stone throw beyond the disciples. He knelt down and he prayed, Father, If you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus modeled what Joshua failed in. 
Joshua did not go to the father. Joshua saw what looked like a good idea. It seemed to make sense. There was a lot of military wisdom in the concept. But Jesus paints the better example of what it looks like to go to the Father in all things, in the big things, in the little things, in the cultural things that surround us in this country right now. Jesus went to the Father. And friends, today as we close, I wanna leave this outline up here for just a minute because we're gonna take a time to just silently reflect. Pastor Eric calls it our exhale time. And we're gonna take a minute to reflect. And here's what I'd like you to do during that minute. What areas today do you need to lean more towards God? So Joshua was this one picture, this photo, if you will, a photo of a sunrise on an airplane traveling to Seattle. But Jesus is the real thing. Jesus is better. So what area this day, this week, do you need to look to Jesus? Joshua was great, but not perfect. Jesus is better. Jesus is perfect. Joshua, his success led to self-reliance. Jesus who is better. His success led to humility. Joshua, he didn't seek God during this decision, but Jesus, he always seeks the wisdom of Father God because Jesus is better. Let's take this moment now to quietly reflect. <laughs>